Welcome to General Psychology. This is an exciting new class being taught at UC Davis. My name is Randy O'Reilly. This class is all about you. We're going to talk about everything you care about. Your brain, that's what I care about is your brain. <laughs> uh, your memories, your fears, your mental disorders, uh, everything that makes you happy, uh, things that make you sad, your friends, and in particular, all the kind of social pressure that we constantly experience interacting with others. And some special others, your parents, you think your parents have a huge influence on who you are. We'll look at some really interesting research about how, what, the, what the science says about that. So take a look in the mirror and let's get started. Let's find out what it is that we think we might already know about you. So, well, of course you're unique, right? I mean, that's obvious. Uh, and I did look that up because I thought, hey, you could spell unique with like you plus unique and who are you, you know? But uh, somebody beat me to it and apparently they're pretty scary so I would avoid them. Um, <laughs> don't sue me. Uh, your brain, and that's why I care about your brain so much, um, has a lot in common with other people's brains, presumably. Like if you're neurotypical, as we say. And so uh, we can actually look at uh, characteristics of the brain and understand how the brain works and try to figure out ways that are kind of consistent and common across all brains, not only human brains, but other kinds of brains, animal brains, chimpanzees, rats, uh, classic psychologists looking at rats. You know, it's really true. We look at rats. Um, <laughs> we can learn a lot from the rat brain. It's really crazy. Um, so we're trying to figure out, you know, what's kind of true in general about you. And of course, uh, people do a lot of research looking at actual people and how actual behave, people behave. And we're trying to put all these things together and figure out, you know, what is it that makes people kind of who they are? And of course, again, you're unique. We're not gonna figure out you in particular. We're really gonna look for the things that are true about people in general, right? And that's what makes this a kind of science and not a biography class or something like that. Uh, many of you may have <laughs> done this uh, kind of uh, magic trick or uh, experienced this magic trick where the answer somehow ends up being gray elephants in Denmark uh, based on very common uh, answers that people are more likely to, to give. And uh, so it's kind of like that. We have enough knowledge about factors that are common across people and the most kind of likely things that we can really figure out a lot about individual people. We are going to look at some common principles that we think really capture the most important things. There's so much we're going to learn about in this class about all the different kinds of things we know about people but what we're going to focus on and what's going to organize and and, and make this a kind of coherent uh, principled account of psychology and neuroscience which is kind of our goal in this class is using a set of three core principles that we're going to uh, introduce here to understand kind of the most important the most general things about you <laughs> Step one, you don't know very much, do you? <laughs> and, you know, it's going to seem like we're kind of insulting you. Uh, I'm sorry, in this uh, presentation here, this first lecture, uh, because a lot of what we know about people is not only what makes them awesome and so smart and so, so incredible, but also kind of human limitations. And we're going to see that this is a complete double-edged sword, okay? It goes absolutely both ways. Um, and so, in fact, just bear with me here. Um, these are drawings of uh, people trying to explain how a bicycle works, okay? And uh, what you can see is very kind of if you actually know how a bicycle works. So, first of all, you may not look at this and say, that's funny. Um, you may look at this and say, yeah, those are bikes. Um, but maybe there's some kind of recognition that says, well, Hmm, those don't quite look right. And really, what is it that happens with the chain? Like you can see here, people have the chain going around both wheels. 
you think about that a little bit, it's going to be a little bit hard to turn the front wheel if you've got a chain around it. Also, uh, yeah, the pedals don't really go there or there. The pedals actually drive the chain. So that's okay over here, but again, the chain is coming off the front wheel, which is going to be tough. Uh, also, the structural kind of integrity of this particular bike is not very strong. Somebody actually made a 3D rendering of uh, what these drawings look like. The main point is not that you don't know how a bicycle works. That's interesting for people who know how bicycles work. But the really interesting result here is that people routinely say, I know how a bicycle works, okay? And it's really that disconnection between how much confidence people have in their knowledge and what they actually know that's the interesting aspect of this work, okay? Uh, and this is a graph of this. Uh, it's known as anosognosia. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> it's unknown, okay? And it's the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld was very famous for articulating. Uh, so here's a graph. Uh, confidence levels uh, relative to competence, or rather levels of knowledge in a given domain. And this is this kind of uh, interesting peak here that when you first start learning about something uh, and you know kind of just enough to be dangerous, as they say, you have this kind of interesting phenomenon where you're high confidence but low knowledge. Uh, then as you start learning more, you start to realize, oh gosh, yeah, that chain, mm, what is that doing? And you kind of get this valley of despair like, uh, I don't know anything about bicycles. Everything I thought I knew I was wrong about. Um, and then as you sort of stick with it, if you do, you start to learn more and more and get up to some kind of, you know, high level of knowledge. Here's the key point. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Does it matter? Tell me it matters. It doesn't matter. Okay. Pee Wee can tell you it doesn't matter. Just have a good time, folks. Um, and that's what we do. And that's why we have these effects. Because for most people, unless you're going to become a bicycle mechanic, uh, or try to save some money and fix your own bicycle, which I did this year, and it was actually not worth it time-wise, but it was kind of fun. Um, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, you ride your bike, you know, you get on it, you know how it works, or the purposes of what you use it for. And this comes down to this really important point that, you know, despite experts trying to tell you you don't know how stuff works, you know what you need to know, okay? And this is the kind of flip side of this is if you spent all your time learning all the stuff that you don't need to know, then you would kind of be wasting your time at some level of description. Because if you don't need to know it, why are you learning it, okay? Um, and there's people who like trivia and they like to learn a bunch of stuff, but most of us don't really do that. And so this is a very adaptive aspect of our brain function. Uh, and we think about it in this way from understanding how your actual neurons work it actually is baked right into your brain. Your brains constantly throw away terabytes of information just surging in at you right now. Here I am, all these pixels, uh, all the stuff that might be happening around you. It's all kind of flooding in and you're just sitting here in this nice serene little focus concentrating on this little story that I'm telling you. And it's all coming through. I'm speaking, you know, all this crazy language is, you know, if you think about what's going on with all the sound stuff and all the phonemes and oh my gosh it's a lot okay but you don't you just sit there and you listen and you say okay well kind of get what this guy's saying but i'm not really sure but in any case this is what your brain is giving you is a very very high level summary and so this is actually a picture of a neuron here's a real neuron over here and here's our kind of diagram of a neuron and the neuron receives about 10,000 different inputs, uh, each sending a kind of pulsing signal of these action potentials that you might have heard about. Um, and that's coming in, and the neuron is taking all that information, 10,000 inputs, each one active in, to some extent, and just sort of compressing them down into one single output channel. So your brain is basically compressing all that information by a factor of 10,000 to one. So this is principle number one in our list of three principles. Uh, we call it compression. 
uh, and we'll see that our principles all start with the letter C. We have uh, many examples of what compression leads to in terms of actual behavioral phenomena. So stereotypes, right? Everywhere, everybody stereotypes everybody. Uh, we have research now that shows us that stereotypes are kind of built in implicitly in everybody, even people who are stereotyped have these kinds of stereotypes in their own brains. And stereotypes really are just ways of compressing all the complexity. People say you should treat each, each individual as an individual, but there's like, I don't know, 9 billion people or whatever. I'm, you know, that's a lot of people. Uh, I can't possibly uh, understand everybody as a unique human being, right? And what I'm doing right here, the whole mission that I just told you about was to sort of come up with these main core compressed principles to try to understand people, okay? So we're trying to understand people in general. Uh, what is true in general about people? Uh, and that's an act of compression itself. And in fact, science is all about taking a huge amount of data and compressing it down into a core set of theories, ideas, principles, just like we're doing here, okay? So uh, it's just, again, it's, it's not good when you have stereotypes. If you operate and make decisions according to stereotypes, especially negative stereotypes, um, without awareness that you might be doing that, um, there's all kinds of bad things that can happen. You know, reg racism, prejudice, obviously horrible. Um, but you also have to understand that this is kind of where, where, it, where it comes from, where it comes from in your brain, how it's kind of baked in, and how we can then intervene and get the good parts of this compression effect without also having the negative parts. So the fact, you know, uh, always lamented by uh, cranky old people that our forms of communication are becoming increasingly tiny and like, you know, it used to be people would read newspaper stories and even like weekly news magazines with long articles studiously analyzing the events of the day and now <laughs> everything's a tweet and a tweet that fits in some tiny number of characters. I'm so old, I don't even know what it is. What is it? 50, 100, 150 characters, I don't know. Um, and so, you know, our, our entire discourse is reduced to this tiny little tweet. It's insane, but it is kind of the natural evolution principle of this kind of compression. Compression drives us to get ever more compact information. If you can communicate a thought in that amount of space, it's so easy, it's so fast. Boom, there it is, a thought. And, uh, and, and you can share it and people can get it quickly and then you can handle so much more tweets. <laughs> Too many tweets. Um, and so, you know, sound bites, uh, texting itself uh, as, a, as a medium of communication, these are the brief, you know, telegraphic messages. Everything is kind of trending towards this simple point. Pretty soon it's just gonna be like one character. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, I don't know. Okay, so more about you. Enough about this principle stuff. Let's talk about you. Okay, well, look at this. You're constantly comparing yourself to other people. It's kind of scary. Uh, you know, uh, it's kind of, again, baked into our brains. Uh, we're going to see how that works. But um, everybody's familiar with this phenomenon that you're, you're, you're sort of surrounded by uh, other people kind of evaluating you, you evaluating yourself relative to other people, uh, how much, you know, richer or better looking or uh, more friends or more intelligent or maybe you want to be dumber so you don't look like a geek or whatever. You know, you're just everybody's comparing against everybody else. And this, this process of comparison um, is also happening over time, okay? So there's this notion of temporal comparison, what happened before versus what's happening now, okay? Um, and so our brain, again, wants to see these differences. It wants to see something new. Uh, and so uh, we're constantly checking our, our cell phones to see, you know, what kind of new information is there, this FOMO, FOMO, fear of missing out, um, and, and just really wanting to always see what's happening in the news. And it's kind of an addiction. Um, and nobody wants to be like that kid. Uh, just so bored if you don't get more information. I need news. And so the principle here is really one of contrast, okay? Our brains don't 
process kind of absolutes, uh, and and we see this nowhere more 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 starkly than uh, when people set different expectations, and you see these double standards everywhere, where someone is held to some kind of higher standard than someone else. Somebody can get away with being a total jerk because uh, the expectation is so low. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, everything we do is not about these kind of absolutes. It's all about relative to expectation, uh, relative to us, relative to other people, how, and then if you go into the perceptual domain, how bright things are relative to other things. And so this principle of contrast, again, is really baked into our brains. We'll see it when we start looking at how the neurons integrate those 10,000 different inputs. Um, and there's a really key balancing act that takes place between inhibitory inputs and excitatory inputs. And every neuron is essentially kind of uh, having this little tug of war taking place inside the neuron. And that results in the kind of firing, that signal that the neuron is sending, being relative. Okay, it's all relative. So we're always weighing, we're always comparing, we're always looking at contrast, we're always trying to see differences. Uh, and this is just a, a really important principle for how we process the world. <sighs> One more thing about you. <laughs> uh, this is tough, right? Self-control. It's hard, right? There's so many temptations out there. Maybe you're into gambling. Maybe you can't control your desire to eat some yummy sweets. This is actually from the famous marshmallow experiment that you may have heard of. Uh, where kids are tested on their level of self-control and their ability to resist eating the marshmallow. Uh, we have all kinds of binging, binge drinking, binge eating, you know, just loss of self-control and, and kind of giving in. And so we all just fundamentally struggle with this uh, issue of how do we maintain control. Beyond just self-control, there's also a huge space of uh, things where we kind of, you know, try to control our world in ways uh, that, you know, include controlling other people. <laughs> I don't know what the story is here. Don't ask me. I just, you know, download these things off the internet. Um, uh, this is kind of, you know, very special here with this crochet kind of thing. Uh, it's like, yeah, you can picture the person who actually takes the time to crochet this pillow. <laughs> exerting control over their environment and keeping things neat as a pin, neat as a pin. Um, and so, you know, we're also controlling our self images in our interactions. We're trying to control other people. Um, our lives are basically all about control. We're, we're controlling the environment, our social world, ourselves, everything. And starkly, uh, when we talk about mental disorders, the loss of mental control is fundamental to mental disorders. Uh, most mental, mental disorders include a serious component of loss of control. And we all feel that at certain times that we're losing control. Maybe we feel like we're losing control in a rage or uh, anxiety or other kinds of negative emotions overcome us. Um, maybe even positive emotions <laughs> overcome us um, and we lose control. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, this wrestle, this battle with control is fundamental to our sense of sanity, um, our sense of place in the world. And if you really kind of resonate with what it's like to feel like you're losing control of your thoughts, of your, of your mind, um, that's, that's really kind of scary. And that's where, uh, kind of, you know, we really start talking about these mental disorders. And so that gives you a window into uh, how important control is fundamentally for the human brain. Um, and so this pervades everything. Principle number three is control. You can see again that they were all starting with the letter C. Um, here's a little diagram of what we know about the brain. Uh, there's this really important part of your brain up here in the frontal part of it. Um, and, you know, in this kind of, you know, stereotyped uh, diagram, a uh, simple uh, soundbite <laughs> representation here. Um, we have a kind of leader role for the frontal cortex. It's telling the rest of the brain, here's what you got to do. And so as far as we know, that's really how it works, that you have uh, an ability to hold on to information in this frontal part of your brain, and it kind of 
shouts at the rest of your brain with the neural firing to say, hey, look, this is what we got to do, folks. Um, and so that's where control comes from. And really interestingly, um, when you go to sleep at night, we'll talk about this when we get to the sleep chapter, uh, this part uh, of your brain goes on vacation. So your, your boss takes a vacation and when the boss is away, the mice will play, right? So we have uh, a kind of freedom a newfound freedom for the rest of your brain and that newfound freedom is kind of what happens in those dream states right and the connection between dream states and kind of hallucinations and losing mental control is profound and very direct that it's really all about losing the influence of this frontal top-down kind of control signal here sort of keeping you on task and freeing up the rest of your mind and so you can also see there's really important trade-offs here in terms of creativity. These have been documented that if you have tamped down really tight control, you don't have as much creativity. If you're not so good at you know, self-control, often those people end up being more creative because um, they don't have this kind of boss yelling at their, the rest of their brain the whole time. So you have really important trade-offs there. There's no right answer in this space, uh, and, but it, it really tells you kind of really how important control is to shaping our mental lives. So there you have it. Everything we know about you in three easy principles, the three C's. Compression, keep it simple stupid, okay, is the old dad kind of uh, way of saying these things. You picture these geeky engineers, keep it simple stupid. Okay, so, but it really pervades everything as we said. Contrast, okay, uh, there's the famous uh, joke, you know, you know, it doesn't matter how fast you are, you just have to be faster than your friend when you're being chased by the bear. There you have it. That's the principle of contrast. It's relative. It's not absolute. Um, and, uh, and then control, we are all kind of agents or secret agents. We have this uh, active, dynamic, controlling role. We're always trying to control the world in an agentic fashion. Okay. Well, next time we'll look into more details about how these uh, principles unfold across the different domains of psychology and neuroscience that we'll be looking at in this course.